<laughs> okay, welcome everyone. My name is Kirsten Sadriekta and I'm a faculty member here in the theater department at UVic and I'm excited to be your host today at the Orion Lecture Series at UVic's theater department. I'm very pleased to introduce today's guest, Diana Roberts. But before I do so, I would like to say thanks and acknowledge the original caretakers of this land and the land we're all finding ourselves on today, whose good work continues each day and so that we're able to gather today in this beautiful place a place that I'm honored to work on, to learn and to play. I'm also very honored to introduce to you all Diana Roberts, who's an accomplished director, dramaturg, teacher, cultural animator with experience for over 30 years across Canada. Diana has been an inspiration for me personally in many ways for my practical work and theoretical thinking. The roots of storytelling and multidisciplinary art forms. So a mixing of ritual, song, dance, story, storytelling, Live art and theater really drives Diana's arts practice. Her facilitation style draws on specifically crafted creative engagement tools that inspire artists of all disciplines and cultural backgrounds to unearth their authentic creative impulses. She is also currently a PhD candidate in interdisciplinary studies at Concordia University in Montreal, where she is finding herself today. And today, Diana will talk about one of her many successful projects, the Arrivals Legacy Project, which has created a vision for theater that encouraged African and indigenous ways of knowing as a stepping stone to creative expression. At the end of Diana's lecture, we will take questions in the Q&A, which I will fill to the questions and pass them on to Diana. Diana, I'm so pleased to have you with us today. The floor is all yours. Thank you so much, Kirsten. It's wonderful to be here, and I'm um, I'm speaking from the territory of the uh, Gerengahaga peoples, um, from uh, Djoké, which is the uh, traditional name of Montreal, and um, yeah, I'm really uh, pleased to be here uh, to share uh, the process with you and the practice. My talk is called "Weaving New Ways of Knowing," and it. It, it will be done in two parts. Part one is embodying futurity on memory and forgetting. Cultural theorist and historian Joseph Roach suggests the most persistent mode of forgetting is memory imperfectly deferred. In the first part of this presentation, I will explore the role of memory and the ethics of strategic forgetting in a future imaginary that wishes to shift the narrative of power, extraction, and commerce to a narrative of collaboration, curiosity, and exchange. I use storytelling as my medium. In the second part of my talk, I will explore the concept of loss as a generative space for creative imaginings that lean into the possibility of weaving new ways of knowing. The story. It is 2251. For the past 85 years, there has been lasting and meaningful peace amongst the global nations. All Western governing bodies have been replaced by the Seventh World Indigenous Transoceanic Coalition Hub, or SWITCH. SWITCH is a depoliticized network of citizens made up of indigenous nations in what was once called the developing world who formed an, an alliance with indigenous communities in Africa and the Americas, supported by the World Associated Diaspora of Color Co Coalition, or WADOCO. After the Great Sickness, there was a collapse of the United States government following the ultimate impeachment of the President of the United States in 2022. At the same time, the vote of no confidence in the parliamentary system in Canada in 2023 and the collapse of the European Union in 2025 birthed a new governing structure entitled SWITCH. SWITCH, which had, which had been operating as an underground network of concerned revolutionaries, were well placed to step up to create a new leadership network that truly represented the people. Switch's campaign was simple. Instead of we the people for the people, or the people have spoken and time's up, all effective mainstream campaigns of refusal 
Switch's strategy of silent refusal, fueled by an ethos of grounded realism, made their powerful message undeniable. Our grandmothers have spoken. We will not rest until they rest. Going beyond a mere slogan or com campaign promise, Switch's message was backed up by well articulated by well articulated action plans to bring about world peace by returning and exchanging traditional ways of knowing, being fueled by their governing value of kinship. This was a movement that was well overdue, brought into existence from an organized global state of refusal to participate in all forms of dominance and control disguised as democracy. With the collapse of the other political structures and the growing outcry for dwindling resources, Switch was elected as a new governing body in an historic landslide vote in 2026. After a rocky start riding the wave of white fragility in its many forms, Switch found its feet and the Switch movement has been growing and functioning for almost 200 years. Founded in the shared traditional values of kinship, autonomy, communality, reflexivity, truth, and responsibility, the primary mission of SWITCH is to restore the principles of peace and collaboration in all areas of, develop of, of development, including trade, governance, national, international, and intergalactic travel, education, arts, communication, social progress, and environmental futures. The central priority of SWITCH is to advocate for environmental sovereignty at all costs. In other words, to give back to Mother Earth the resources she needs to restore herself. In response to the SWITCH governing body's new environmental policy agreement, or NEPA, Mother Earth began to repair herself in 2033 and is today 98% restored. With governing leadership hubs around the world, the SWITCH Interdisciplinary Research Center has developed an advanced communication technology that encourages collective decision making that is generative for each home community and the communities they collaborate with. This technology was developed by representative scholars, artists, engineers, and digital communication specialists drawn from every region of the world. Through collaborative study of the surviving North, Central, and South American petroglyphs, African cave paintings, and Latinx indigenous, indigenous codices, the working group rediscovered a generative way to tap into the Earth's core as a mediating force for decision-making. They discovered a specific frequency emerged generated by the movement of healing dancers. For example, North American indigenous powwow dances, the Hawaiian Kukilau dance, the Garifuna Punta dance, the Maori Haka, the Congolese Zebula, the Palestinian Dabka, and the Aztec Concheros. These dances in dialogue with specifically calibrated drum and rhythmic patterns and vocal frequencies started a new way of, of moving and talking and communicating with each other. The working group discovered that the specifically chosen patterns enacted as a global ritual would activate a chain reaction between the heated core and the movement of the tectonic flakes providing an unprecedented energy burst that would not only heal the core, but that could also be harnessed into a communication system for decision, for decision making. This ritual offering in my Garifuna language is called Daranyu Benya. In English, it is called the open door. It's challenging to describe the exact processes here to such a lay audience as I am not an engineer, nor am I a bouye or sacred teacher, but suffice it to say, this discovery had a major impact on the success of Switch's initiative as it provided a globally responsive foundation for achieving what we all hoped for, a true meeting of the minds. <laughs> Hile, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
A side effect of this technology, however, was discovered over 50 years ago. Creative technologists discovered that very particular negative memories were being erased those of anti-Black and brown racism, and the effects of this was felt in all areas of society. During the first signs of erasure, it was decided that this was an acceptable loss, as it seemed to create a lightness of being, especially amongst Black and brown peoples. Freed up from the impediments of their colonial pasts, they thrived, and the rest of the world thrived as a result. As these memories faded from the psyches of the people, so did violence against black and brown peoples, war, political jockeying and criminal intent. Although things weren't perfect, there was a measured improvement. 50 years later, while much has progressed, a few anomalies have begun to emerge. Although the memories of black and brown racism have been completely wiped from the consciousness of at least two generations, disruptive anomalies have begun to, surf to surface. Psychic fissures have entered the minds of some of our vulnerable young people, causing latent memories to slip through the cracks and manifest in disturbing ways. We are attempting to address this through an integrated arts movement that allows those impacted an outlet for expression. The Codex Project Exchange, or COPE, will, we hope, serve as a healing tool to address these fissures by restoring some of the memories that have been lost. Chicana queer and feminist cultural theorist Gloria Anzaldua speaks about the Nautil concept of Nepantla. She de describes it in this way. Living between cultures results in seeing double first from the perspective of one culture, then from the perspective of another. Seeing from two or more perspectives sim simultaneously renders those cultures transparent. Removed from that culture's censure, you glimpse the sea in which you've been immersed, but to which you were oblivious, no longer seeing the world the way you see it. For Anzaldua, Nepantla, is terra incognita. And living in this liminal zone means being in a constant state of displacement and uncomfortable, even alarming feeling. Poet and cultural critic M. Norbesi Philip offers that to strip a people of the gift of their culture is a double act of inhumanity for both the victim and the perpetrator who is also the victim. In my future story, I chose to explore a future imaginary released from the baggage of colonial shame in order to interrogate the ben benefits and ethics of strategic forgetting. My protagonist unconsciously draws on the power of Philip's warning that we must not forget neither the oppressor nor the victim, not Canada or the indigenous person, the African or the Asian, to forget would be tantamount to engaging in massive and collective social amnesia. So in this story, I interrogate the ethics of strategic forgetting, shifting between what Philip would name the dynamics of belonging and becoming. Part two, there is no bypassing loss. What are the legacies we carry and what do we leave behind? Founded in 2003 as a creative engagement tool for displaced indigenous migrant artists and communities, the Arrivals Legacy Project is designed to unearth embodied root cultural practices and authentic creative impulses through ancestral connections. The strength of the arrivals process lies in its application as a story generating and community development tool to ignite, negotiate, and reconcile diverse perspectives. 
It has proven itself to be a powerful initiator and developer of collaborative artistic creations that address transdisciplinary, intergenerational, and cross-cultural concerns. The arrivals process enacts an approach to collaborative responsibility that is geared toward particular centers of gravity that are rooted in the body and infused by the spirit. As a result, the process itself demands a level of engagement that contradicts the traditional role of the artist as researcher, as knowledge producer, by asking them to step into a state of unknowing and to grapple with what is potentially unknowable. As participants and co-facilitators, we strip ourselves down to face, experience, and embody our own ancestral legacies and mythologies while deeply witnessing this process in others. The practice of deep witnessing implicates us in each other's stories, causing us to sneak under each other's borders and to compassionately entangle ourselves in the histories or legacies that might otherwise divide us. Through arrivals, we draw on our individual and collective ancestries and journey towards arriving at the dis or recovery of root cultural practices as a creative storehouse for cultural production. We carry a legacy. There is no bypassing loss, loss of language, culture, dance, songs, history, memory, bodies, home. According to Haitian historian Jean-Michel Trouillot, silences enter the process of historical production at four crucial moments. The moment of fact creation or the making of sources, the moment of fact assembly or the making of archives, the moment of fact retrieval, the making of narratives, and the moment of retrospective significance, the making of history in the final instance. When speaking of archival knowledges, Trio asks the, asks the question, how do we recognize the end of a bottomless silence? There are stories mingled in our blood, buried in bones and breath, stories waiting to be told. Our bodies naturally make images consciously and unconsciously. This is not only for communication, but in response to our environment, our history and experience, our needs and desires. When we create story from these images, we increase our ability to see and capture them in space and time. If indigeneity were linked to water instead of earth, how would that change the language of ownership? or one's sense of rootedness. The African storyteller has often been described as a chameleon. Sing out the tempo of loke toe, turn left then right. They change with the shape of each story by bending themselves in service. This ability to adapt one's essence, one's very being can have both positive and negative implications. What if, for example, the story carries you across the ocean against your will in the dank and dark hold of a vessel headed for a new world. Adapting to this story might require you to actively and forcefully forget, minimizing the horrors of the dehumanizing journey. In this crossing, the chameleon storyteller may have become the vessel, the hold, the rats, the stagnating excrement plastering the floors and walls, and yet suppressing the screams they will speak of rivers suppressing the stench, the whip, the oppressor's fist and dick, and still they will rise. Forgetting in the new world becomes not only a strategy for survival, but a rite of passage. My father's crossing from St. Vincent to South Wales on the SS Madanina was an easier one. His journey was by choice. A runner and high jumper for the Commonwealth Games, he left home, filled with hopes for the future. He left the land, his family, his friends, and all that he knew to learn more, to grow, to forge a new path, 
leaving home and inadvertently erasing home. And my story picks up in Canada, curious about crossings and lives lived there and then, in residues and conjecture, searching through past and unexpected clues found on the land I now call home. I imagine the there and then in the here and now. At times the worlds feel far apart, the answers unreachable. The context for the arrivals legacy work is, has been, and will continue to be the colonized body. And though I begin from a personal contextual framework, the arrivals personal legacy process in its development reveals its universal application for cultural reclamation. We are living legacies. We gather, deposit, and imprint residues in every interaction with our past, our present, and the world around us. The motivation behind arrivals comes from many years of witnessing the profound disconnect that so many racialized artists in North America experience about ourselves, our environment, and our, our cultural histories. One cannot discount as a contributing factor the lingering effects of colonization, migration, and the forces of assimilation. For Afrosporic peoples, this alien alienation is compounded by anti-Black racism, dehumanizing violence, and the deracination of our contributions to modern culture. We carry a legacy. When we carry our own weight, we carry our full potential. When we put ourselves into a situation where and when our creative bodies and breath and voice and mind can thrive, a state of letting go, we begin to tap into an abundant source of inspiration. In the environmental movement, we learn to reduce our carbon footprint. In ceremony, we learn that we must deepen our footprint, step fully into our stories and let them unfold around us. Poet laureate Derek Walcott speaks of the roughly hewn beauty of our inherited fragmentation as Antillian peoples. Break a vase, he says, and the love that reassembles the fragments is stronger than that love which took its symmetry for granted when it was whole. And if the pieces are disparate, ill-fitting, they contain more pain than their original sculpture. Those icons and sacred vessels taken for granted in their ancestral places. At the center of this process is the acknowledgement that everything we need to draw on for inspiration is stored in our bodies as stories and fragments of stories, mingled in our blood, buried in our bones. In the performer's village, the witness is as important as the performer. We discover that there are several layers of witnessing. As witnesses and performers, you are in the village circle witnessing yourselves, your fellow villagers, and the shifting and changing environment around you as you co collectively move closer to the creative fire. Through the arrivals process, we collectively and individually reclaim gestures that give us a sense of deep knowing, valuing the wisdom of embodied archives in dialogue with written archives. We consider the process of landing. We witness ourselves through our chosen ancestor who in the process of their landing might have been forced to reconstruct new identities. We trace ruptured continuities and develop new ways of seeing ourself in another, ourself in another's land. And through this, we lean into the possibility of weaving a new kind of knowing. I propose that as we navigate our constant state of betweenness or betweenity as uh, Norbessi Philip has coined it, we gain fresh insights about our relationship to land. This is particularly important in the context of Indigenous land claims and the global call for reparations. And finally, we uncover what we need to navigate our root cultural traditions. We recall and engage with our inherited practices and find, create, discover, new practices that address our contemporary 
an ancient longing for connection. In our need to navigate conflicting cultural protocols, we find ourselves in uncovering deeper truths, translating them from contemporary gestures into ceremonies and rites of passage. There are stories, under skin, mingled in blood, buried in bones and breath, we are called to carry these stories, to deepen our footprints, and to provide a clear path for those that follow. And that uh, concludes my um, formal presentation, but uh, I'm happy to have a discussion about um, any of the anything that I raised in my paper. Um, so thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much, Diane. I, ha I have a, a lot of questions, but I'm, I'm just going to wait if we get any other Q&A questions in the chat and then mm -hmm. otherwise I will, I will ask some of mine. Thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, then I start off with one of the questions I have. I think um, one of the things that I would like to talk with you about is about authenticity so what you talk about authentic creative impulses um, and living legacies and I was just wondering if you could give us a little bit an idea about um, how that works in practice like when when you're in a workshop room with your participants how does you how do you sort of navigate through authentic creative impulses well um, there are six stages to the process um, and um, we we start off with uh, the research phase of the pro of the project where um, people do the sort of heady part, the researching their ancestor, um, the creating a profile of their ancestor, and then they come into the workshop, and then we start to um, work through uh, an embodied process uh, to unravel. Uh, the, the knowing places in their bodies. So we sort of take the research that they've done and we sort of put it aside and we start from a place of what is this vessel? So mm -hmm. I, I often talk about um, our bodies as a village so that there are many ways of, um, of or the, the many parts of our body and the way that they move in space, the way that they um, uh, sh the way that we shift weight, the rhythmic uh, possibilities within our bodies, we start to train ourselves and start to try to listen for where those breath spaces live in our bodies, um, where the rhythmic processes um, are easy and where they, there's resistance to some of those rhythmic processes. And so we, we spend quite a bit of time really getting to know the village that we carry ourselves in through the world and um and through this process of unraveling a uh, uh, a kind of uh, knowing about what this body this village can do in space and also doing this in relationship to other people in the space so we so we're, we're starting to sort of um activate our bodies and also witness the activation of other bodies in space. And we start to learn this process of witnessing the shifts in, um, in ourselves and in others. And then there are different planes of existence that happen in the workshop where we've all brought in an ancestor that we've spent time researching. Mm -hmm. So there's this process that has already started to engage between the person um, the, the village, the, the individual person and their ancestor. And then there's another relationship that starts to develop between each other in the workshop and then between the ancestors in the workshop hmm. and, then the, and then between the ancestors on the land and territory that we're working on. So it becomes this really um, vibratory space where possibilities, creative imagining, start to happen, coincidences show up. We start listening for those uh, story fragments that start to emerge. And I talk about catching story um, 
and uh, it, as opposed to making story. Right. Yeah. So, so it becomes this kind of magical um, space where anything can happen. And, and it's in our, in, in our inquiry and in, in our curiosities that the anything happens, the, the anythings that can happen actually starts to happen. And we notice them and we catch them and we say, wow, this is really interesting. And at first we may look at things and say, well, isn't that a coincidence? And then we start to realize that there are no coincidences, <laughs> you know, and that story emerges in really interesting ways. And do you um, sometimes see a thread between stories as well? Sorry, to no, no, uh, a breath between stories. A thread between different stories that are, are emerging in the in the workshop room. Yeah, most definitely, there there starts to emerge, uh, and and it's again through these different curiosities. Uh, there, there starts to emerge certain themes. Um, and also as we're doing our training, we're also getting close to trying to understand our root cultural practices. So we're bringing in protocols into the space, like um, so they might be in the form of an object. And we're starting to build um, our space as a kind of ceremonial or ritual space that is made up of these different um, protocols that may or may not be in conflict with one another. So we're always in constant negotiation. Right. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> uh, I have a question in the, in the chat from Yasmin Candios, one of my colleagues in the theater department. Mm -hmm. And she says, hi, Dan, thanks for your presentation. Could you please expand on the point you were discussing around witnessing and implicating yourself in the work? Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question, Yasmin. It's um, yeah, this this uh, this witness role is a is a complex and layered thing that happens. So we start off, as I was saying, we start off learning to witness what's going on inside of ourselves, inside of this vessel. So we prepare the vessel. We we. Um, yeah, we start to learn how the stories exist in our bodies. I talked about these stories being locked in our, our bodies. So we open up the breath spaces where some of these stories may emerge and we start to notice things. Um, so that witness starts to come alive. Mm -hmm. And then the witness of our ancestors well starts to come alive. So we're starting to establish a relationship between uh, ourselves and the ancestor and what we what I've noticed in the process is that when people choose an ancestor it seems to be that it's the ancestor they need for that particular time so there's there are things that are already starting to happen in this relationship um, there's a, a shaman and um, and scholar uh, his name is Maladoma Somme from the Bur Burkina Faso, um, Dagara peoples, who talks about uh, this idea of uh, ancestral stories being unfinished stories and that, mm -hmm. that there's a, a need for these stories to be completed through us. And I know that uh, there are also psychological processes that use this, the constellations work that um, uh, the German psychologist, I can't remember his name, um, uh, works on as well. So, so there's this idea that um, there's a relationship that's developing. And then in the village circle, there's a relationship of witnessing that happens. So we really learn how to witness each other's processes and stories that start to emerge. And um, and then we start to witness some of the magical aspects of the process um, and the story fragments that start to emerge as we get closer to, um, well, what I, what I call the creative fire, but as we get closer to the sort of inner truths um, that we're searching for, because everybody comes into the workshop searching searching for the story, searching for a deeper truth about their ancestor, about themselves, etc. So as that process starts to deepen itself, um, 
and we we start to learn how to kind of witness in each other uh, you know how those stories are emerging and that's part of the training of the workshop how do we catch story for each other and mm. hold each other and then the facilitation team is a whole other layer of witness where they are I work with um, if I have a, a workshop of eight to 10 people, I would work with two other co-facilitators so that we can hold the room um, from a, a sort of wider um, part of the spiral, let's say. <laughs> um, hmm. Yeah. Does that make sense? And did that answer your question, Yasmin? I don't know if Yasmin can answer, but- Yeah, <laughs> okay. I'm sure it, it, did, it did for me. Mm -hmm. Um, just to follow up on that, so how, even if you have two um, co-facilitators, how do you hold the room? What are some of the, the tips you have for students or for practitioners mm. in the room? So what are some of the things that you found very successful in holding a room as a facilitator? Um, well, there's a deep attention and it's very interesting because we're in a time now where we can't gather in space. And I, I wasn't sure how this work could be translated into digital space. Um, but I just recently completed a project that that, act, that actually worked in an interesting way. But, but going back to when we're in the space together, how do we hold space for each other? It, it's really about, oh yeah, the other part of Yasmin's question is about implicating yourself. It's really about putting yourself in the feet of the other. Hmm. Um, so it's so that what even when I facilitate, I'm facilitating from inside. So I'm not I'm not, I'm uh, I'm talking through the exercises, but I'm doing the exercises as I'm talking through the exercises. So I'm witnessing all the little things that happen in my own body and facilitate from that place of present of presence. So I might say, oh, I'm feeling a little, um, I, I'm, I'm doing this rhythmic movement and I'm feeling a little bit of resistance in my spine. Hmm. So I might say, breathe into your spine. Or I might say, loosen your hips. Uh, let's loosen our hips. Or I might say, bring your attention to your, the backs of your knees. So I'm, so, so we're, we're trying to um, speak from that place of presence in our bodies in the moment. And as we do the training, we start to learn to notice these things and to notice all the different shifts and changes that happen within us and not take them for granted. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, uh, I've forgotten the question. But, um, How you hold the room as a facilitator. Oh, Some of the yeah, so, yeah. so in a way where everybody is being trained to be um, almost like um, semi-permeable <laughs> membranes, you know, for, for each other. So that we're, when we witness each other, we're also witnessing through our own experiences. So I might say, oh, it's really interesting because I'm holding my breath right now and I don't know why I'm holding my breath. And I may not go to story, I might not say, I may see that you're holding your breath too, but I might not say, oh, you're holding your breath. Right. You're holding your breaths, and that means that you're scared, you know? So I make a story out of it. But I say, I, I'm holding my breath, and I can feel myself that doing this. And then I might say, are you holding your breath? And they say, yeah, I am holding my breath. Well, that's weird. Okay, why are we holding our breath? And then we start to unpack that moment right in the presence right. of when it's happening without trying to jump to story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, you, oh, I have another question. I will, I will stop asking questions. I'll go to the, another question of one of my colleagues in the theater department as well, Sasha Kowak. Mm -hmm. Thank you for this work, Dan. In your discussion of this process, you consider the element of ritual in the process. Are there ever concerns about bringing these rituals into the theatrical environment and making such officious performances into a story that is told in a theater, a space of spectacle? Yeah, yeah, I think we we talk through that a lot and even um 
bringing ritual and shared rituals. What, what I talk about um, drawing on our root cultural processes, there's negotiation that needs to happen between our ancestor, between us. Um, my ancestor's protocol may not be something that I'm comfortable with. Mm. Um, and your ancestor's protocol might be something that I'm not comfortable with. So how do we negotiate the space for those protocols to exist and step into, again, that's, I, I always use the uh, fire metaphor. How do we step into the fire of that? <coughs> so for example, um, sage and alcohol are two medicines um, from two different culture, root cultural perspectives. So how do we negotiate the use of libation using alcohol in the same space <coughs> with um, the uh, sage? Mm. So we find a way, we found, <coughs> excuse me, let me just take a sip of my tea. Sure. <coughs> I should say this cough. <clears throat> this cough comes when I do the work, and it's and it <laughs> and it's one of my uh, tells that I'm in, in I'm, the work. Yeah, I'm in the work. I'm I'm connected to my source, which was my grandfather. Right. Um, so it's it's often it often comes, and it's really frustrating when it does. But I always um, seem to forget that it's connected. So I just wanted to acknowledge my grandfather <laughs> and his presence, but, um, but uh, yes, um, where were we? Uh, Negotiating the ritual, the two, the sage and alcohol. Mm -hmm. So, so there's that process of having to negotiate um, shared protocols within the village. And then as the ceremonies sort of realize themselves. Um, I, I talk about ceremony and I talk about ritual, but there's so much, there's, they develop in such a way that they are, they are not necessarily, um, a ritual that uh, is too sacred to be shared hmm. because the ongoing negotiation that we have with our ancestors, with our ancestral subject, within our village circle, is about the relationship between my contemporary being here and my um, and you know the traditions that I bring with me. So I think it it it's kind of um, I think it's it's kind of an evolving process through the create through the creation process for artists that take the work and take them to the next stage in performance so that by the time they get to performance they've <coughs> been able to create and um create the pro the protocols that would contain the rituals that are being enacted on stage and i think that sort of responsibility to do that is in a uh, a constant or is part of a constant dialogue that they would have uh, with their ancestral subject, but also with it's part of the dramaturgy that I bring to a work if we're taking a work um, um, from the studio into towards uh, production. It's part of the protocols of trying to figure out, okay, well, what what does feel right and what feels not right to be shared. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but I just want to acknowledge that it did make sense what you how you answered yes means answer because she just confirmed as well that that made complete sense. <laughs> so thank you for that. Mm -hmm. So how did you sort of come up with that mix of art forms that you're using, storytelling, life art, ritual? How that how did it sort of develop? It was it, it naturally developed because of the artists that I was working with. Um, the uh, collaborators. I, I started doing this process uh, um, actually in a class. I was teaching an introduction to um, acting class and um, when I was doing a residency here at Concordia, this was many years ago, 2003. 
And um, then after having done the process with the students and realizing the power of it, I took it um, to uh, York University with, and worked with master's students and PhD students on the process. And that's where I found my first partner in the work, which was Heather Hermont. And she and I then went to Galliano Island in Vancouver to uh, do a residency with Urban Inc. It was before I took over the company. Right. Um, we did a residency to really explore the practice, exploring her ancestral subject. Um, and we really started to uh, deepen our understanding of what this process was that was emerging. And she herself is an interdisciplinary artist, uh, poet, and uh, wasn't a theater artist. She was a poet and uh, a spoken word artist and such. So, and, and she was also working with video and interdisciplinary arts. And so that's how I started um, working, I think more into through interdisciplinarity. Right. Um, and then as I took this workshop um, to Urban Inc. and we started to do the Canada um, tour of the workshops, we did six cities. Um, the people that were attracted to the work were mostly interdisciplinary artists. Hmm. Um, in fact, there were very few people that called themselves actors or theater people. They were all, they all had a, a, a multidisciplinary practice. Right. Um, and it might be that many of the people that I worked with were Indigenous artists and racialized artists whose traditions of, of art making weren't necessarily uh, from a Western um, source or root. Uh, and yeah, and I, I, think, I think it's always been my interest to, to do interdisciplinary work. And in fact, I, there was a time when I actually stopped calling myself a theater artist because I felt it was limiting. Mm -hmm. um, I've circled back. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all? <laughs> I have a few more questions for you. One is from Jacques Rimet. In your process, how do you know that you have truthfully arrived to your ancestral embodiment? Mm. Um, you just have to take the process. <laughs> <laughs> and why not? No, I'm I'm being silly, but I I mean I I think you know it when you know it. Like you there uh the images that you saw were all people uh who have given me permission to use these pictures, the images in the slideshow were all people at different stages in the process. Um and you can see, I I hope you can see in the images those moments that are really pure and um, not generated. They, they're, not, they're not performed or generated, but they're right in the center of this moment of discovery and opening. But you can breathe it, like you can breathe this open. And, and it's always surprising to me because I often go into a workshop thinking, this is going to be the workshop where it's all going to be revealed that this is all nonsense. <laughs> You know, I go in with a lot of doubt hmm. uh, myself still, but but every single time there's magic that happens and people are are transformed, like completely transformed um, by what seems to me sometimes to be very simple exercises. I do an exercise um, uh, from the work often in, if I'm doing presentations in, uh, in um, spaces where we do this, um, this process, we stand up with hands open, we sit down with hands closed, we stand up with hands open, we sit down with hands closed, we slap our thighs, we stamp our feet, we expose our throats to the inner circle or we raise our heads to the ceiling, we let out a sound or a song, and then we look into each other's eyes, and then the process starts. Oh, and then somebody steps into the middle of the circle and offers a gesture, we, stamp our, we slap our thighs, we stamp our feet, very, very sort of 101 exercises. But every time I've done this exercise, I do it with such, um, 
well that doubt that that sense of I don't know what this is I I just I start it and people do it and there's this I don't know it's like inhibitions sort mm. of melt away and people arrive in a different way in a set like I've done this with elders I've done this with children <laughs> um, and uh, adults <laughs> of different walks of life and there's always this same childlike entry into this exercise that turns itself into a ritual that turns itself into a story and mm. then itself into a memory and every time we go through it it's surprising and magical how easy it is for us to fall into this kind of story body like I I just offer these gestures this is what we do this is what we do and all of a sudden <laughs> I stop talking about what we're doing and we just all do it together and then it becomes its own ritual without me having to say now we're going to move into a ritual state you know mm -hmm. and i and i use that exercise in fact <laughs> that exercise came to me when i was trying to do a revisionist um, version of the history of theater um, i was giving a presentation um, it was that brown bag lunch session and uh, I wanted to introduce this idea of, um, yes, we start around the stories, the story circle. Um, yes, the stories come out and then there's a fire in the middle of the circle. And then the traditional way we learn is that the first actor, the Thespis, stepped out of the village circle and became an actor. And then we get this proscenium idea and I say bull pocky that the first actor stepped into the fire and became the fire and then and that's how you know the individual performer came alive and it was the village's responsibility to keep fanning the flames and to keep that fire alive inside the performer so that there was a reciprocal relationship between the performer and the village circle. And so I, I used that exercise um, or that exercise sort of came to me. I just started writing it and it came to me and I just started practicing it, not knowing what it was. <laughs> and then I did this exercise in St. Vincent <laughs> in Garifuna territory. And um, uh, somebody who knows the uh, traditional rituals of the Garifuna peoples uh, whispered in my ear, this is what we do in our ceremonies. Hmm. And so, you know, you kind of think, okay, well, that's very interesting. And I don't know what that means, <laughs> you know, and that's part of what my, uh, my um, thesis research is about, is really trying to figure out how and why this process chose me and what, who am I right. in this process, you know? So I don't know, that was kind thank of- Thank you, yeah, no, that's, that's I've again. learned a lot already, yeah, thank you. <coughs> um, we have, I think, time for one more question. Um, that's Rebecca Haas, she's asking, is there anything particular you would advise in this work when you have youth in a room, high school age? Youth are amazing in this work. Um, well, you know, there's a period of time when youth are amazing in this work. Um, I think like the 15 to 18 year olds are a little bit, or maybe 15 to 17 are a little bit more challenging. Mm -hmm. And I, I found that when I've done this work with young people, that age range, I have to keep, I have to create more um, exercises for them to, uh, engage in. So I, you know, I, I just have more tricks up my sleeve. Um, whereas younger kids are, they're just right there. I had an 11 year old, um, and even younger, an eight year old who, who just were ready to 
completely um, embrace this process and enter into the stories with their ancestors. Um, yeah, so what would my advice be? I mean, <clears throat> uh, patience, <laughs> I mean, patience and um, some of the reflection work that we do with adults isn't as um, long and, uh, and because they don't have the attention span. So I think finding ways to create um, uh, metaphors for them to, uh, to, to be able to tell the stories um, is, is really the trick. But I had some, like, I'm just thinking back to, again, Galliano Island and Cooper Island. I was working with indigenous um, uh, youth in uh, those two communities. We were working on a joint project uh, together and it was just, yeah, it was just extraordinary, the, the discoveries in the process and the elders that were also involved in witnessing and parents witnessing their their children embody their um, their own parents. I've got tons of stories, but we don't <laughs> well, maybe we have time for one last question because we still mm -hmm. have a few minutes. And I have one from Nancy Curry, who's one of our uh, PhD candidates at UVic, and she's asking: Is it clear that the workshop process has a therapeutic effect on the participants? Do you mm -hmm. consider this work to be aligned or connected with drama therapy at all, or do you conceive this work? as different from the work of ther drama therapists? Um, I don't know much about uh, the methodologies of drama therapists, but I would say there is definitely healing properties in this work. Um, and it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, the, the work wasn't made for, the, or it wasn't created as a healing process. And there was quite a bit of time when I, I felt I needed to fight for the creative parts of the process. And, and, and when I say fight for it, it was mostly people at the councils that were trying to uh, uh, diminish it into, you know, a, a healing practice or, you know, and, and I say, and again, you know, I'm using these words that I'm not happy about, but, um, Again, the, the 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 idea of diminishing to healing practice um, versus a creative process, like separating the the two, it it just it, I I often felt shoehorned into something, or they were trying to shoehorn the process to try and understand it. But I think there's something deeper and more holistic about the creative endeavors that then create. A healing practice, um, sort of in my future story, a little bit of the idea of the earth, you know, by mm -hmm. um, by he, uh, putting our focus on healing the earth, the earth started to heal us back. So there's a reciprocal uh, reflexivity, I guess, between the the um, creative aspects of the process and our intentions are going towards that but it's also about this life-giving force about the reconnecting to one's root culture and and the depth of that for those especially those who have been separated from any sense of the root for me it's a healing process every time i do the workshop um it's a healing process process for me to reconnect to continue to reconnect mm -hmm. and find that sense of belonging it came out of this need to belong and uh, yeah so yeah so I'm not sure I, I'm not sure how it relates it would be an interesting um, exercise to speak to a drama therapist about mm -hmm. it and to find out where the intersections are right <clears throat> So Yasmin, my colleague, was actually interested in the, 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 the sort of story you told about the 2051, 2251. And if that's coming out of the Arrivals Legacy project, was it intentionally utopian? Is it a finalized work or a work in progress? It's a work in progress. It was actually um, a final assignment. I wrote that story for an Indigenous Futures class. Um, and... Uh, then I, when I started doing presentations, 
I saw that there was a relationship between that strategic forgetting story and the presentation I do for arrivals. So I started putting it together just this past summer. I started practicing and speaking that story um, in relationship to the arrivals process. So I'm still discovering what that relationship is. And I'd like to keep writing that story because I, <clears throat> I'm very interested in that protagonist um, and where she lands herself. Uh, it, it started off as just a sort of future story and then started to develop itself as a confession. Um, or a, a, I imagined her speaking to a council of people defending what she had done and as the story goes on she um reveals that anyway I, I think it'd be too much to tell you but but basically uh more happens where the young people who have been exposed to the archives that open up the memories of um anti-black and brown racism right it starts to really um damage them so she's come to defend her position of um introducing them back to the memories <laughs> as an ethics as an ethical dilemma basically so i want to write the chapter where the council responds and then just keep seeing how the story evolves right <laughs> thank you so much diana for being with us today um, I just want to remind the students that we will have a Zoom office hour from 2 to 3 p.m. today. Uh, thank you all for, for being with us today. And thank you so much again for Dan for being with us. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you.